In Acts chapter 11, we looked at Peter's response to some of the questions that came from Jerusalem. In the first part of the chapter, we see that the apostles and brethren who were in Judea heard that the Gentiles had also received the word of God. That's what verse 1 of chapter 11 tells us. And we talked a little bit about this, that Peter, clearly, God used him in such a miraculous way. We've been on this whole thing about, you know, the right attitude. People want to be led by the Spirit. People want to be used by God. But you got to have the right attitude in order for God to be glorified and how he might use us. And I believe a statement was made last week as to where we would say something of this nature. If you desire a move of God in your life, then there are some things you're going to have to just kind of let go of. And we dealt with the area of sin. And um, oftentimes that is the great hindrance of God's spirit working in and through our lives. And I have a very hard time, uh, you know, when people come to me and they say they're hearing from God, but so many areas in their lives, there is a practice of sin. And it's very difficult because these men that God used, though they were not perfect, and none of these men were perfect, and none of them were sinless. I mean, look at Peter. Peter was a man that God had to deal with the prejudices of his heart. And what God did was God used circumstances to work these prejudices out of his heart and then did the miraculous in a Gentile culture, in the cities of Joppa and Linda, and then he went and stayed at the house of a tanner, which was not common for a Jew to do. And yet all the while, God did a great work in a unclean culture. Let's just put it that way. So it, so it, so it piqued Peter's interest. Then God uses the vision of clean and unclean, and then kind of charges Peter and says, don't call what I've created uncommon or unclean. And, and, and so what we see here is Peter's heart being dealt with because Peter still was a prejudiced Jew. The Jews, even the ones who came to faith in Christ Jesus, still had a hatred for Gentiles in their heart. And they were still practicing uh, great portions of the law. They just came to the realization that Jesus fulfilled the law. You couldn't detach their practices from one moment to the next or overnight because this is what they lived according to. But they were growing in the grace of God. They were growing in the power of the Holy Spirit. And the more that we've seen, at least in Peter's case, because this is what we've been studying the last couple of Wednesday nights, the more Peter yielded to the leading of the Spirit, the more God stretched him and the more he was able to practice and demonstrate faith. And Peter would have never went to the Gentiles or did what he did in Acts chapter 10 if the Lord would not have first dealt with the issues of Peter's heart. And then we see that Peter allowed the Lord to do that. He didn't resist. First he said, not so. Three times this happened, and then finally the Spirit spoke to Peter and said, three men are coming and looking for you. You need to go with them. And he obeyed, and he went. And the Bible says they didn't even have the full revelation yet as to what God was doing, but yet he trusted. That's faith. And then we see Peter meets Cornelius. We know the story. The Holy Spirit came as they preached the word. Now Gentiles get saved and accept Jesus as Lord and Savior. And then it was a miraculous thing. They, they tell Peter to stay with them a couple of more days, and he's baptizing them. They're speaking in tongues just like the Jews did in Acts chapter 2. And when we just read right now verse 1 of chapter 11, these Gentiles who the Jews, even the believing Jews that were Christians, hated... It got to Jerusalem that these Gentiles received the word of God. Not only did they receive the word of God, but the same demonstration of the spirit that happened to the Jews happened to them. Now the question is, how can they have had the same experience that we have, listen to this, if salvation is of the Jews? You guys got to understand that that statement was referred to throughout the New Testament, even by Jesus himself, because this was a common understanding among the Jewish people, that salvation was for them and nobody else. And this was the dialogue that Jesus had with the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman. Well, we know in Acts chapter 8, 
The Samaritans had their Pentecost, right? And it's interesting because in all cases, word gets back to Jerusalem. Philip's ministry flourishes there in Samaria, right? And we see that a delegation from Jerusalem, they send them to Samaria to testify of these works. Now, this is the next thing that's going to happen here. After Peter has had this great experience, like Philip did in Acts 8, Peter has it in Acts 10. And this word comes, and Peter came to Jerusalem, and the Jews, those of the circumcision, contended with him. They said, we heard you were eating with Gentiles. We heard that you were in their home. We heard that they didn't even care that the Gentiles experienced the baptism of the Holy Spirit. They were more concerned with Peter being unclean because he was eating with Gentiles. And through Peter's story, God began to deal with the prejudices of their heart also. You see the power of the gospel here? The power of the gospel not only transforms and saves a person's life, but the power of the gospel begins to clearly change a person's heart. Peter became a man who was really acquainted with failure in his early years, but then became very acquainted with the presence and the power of God, but then also became very acquainted with God dealing with his heart and revealing to him that, Peter, I can use you as much as you would like me to. But if there are these things in your heart, we cannot go any further. And ultimately, that's kind of what the whole picture was. Now we see how God so graciously moves upon Peter's heart, and then you see that Peter clearly defends the very grace of God in verses 1 through 18. And then Peter begins to say a couple of things took place. He says, one, he received a revelation from the Lord. That's what he told them first, right? Secondly, he said, then the Spirit of God spoke to him. And then thirdly, he says in verse 16, I remembered the word of the Lord. And what did he do? He took the situation, backed it up with Scripture, and said, I didn't just do this on my own. This is what the Word says. This is what the Spirit told me. This is what God revealed to me. And then he explained in verse 17 and 18 the experience. Those things all come together when God is at work, especially in the church. There's a revelation from the Lord. This revelation from God, is, it, it's real, it's tangible. And then the revelation from the Lord, as it came to Peter, Peter then says the Spirit of the Lord spoke to him, directed him, led him. And then after this, he goes on to say, and I was reminded of the Word of God. So there was a revelation in the Word of God. And then the experience takes place in verses 17 and 18. So Peter is pretty much saying in so many words, he's saying, listen, this is a work of God. Then those that heard these things in verse 18, the Bible says they became silent and they glorified God saying, then God has also granted to the Gentiles repentance of life. This is an amazing thing. Why? Because we're Gentiles. This is now salvation. If, if Peter wouldn't have allowed God to work in his heart, this is why we talk so much about you want to experience the move of God in your life, you need to have the right attitude. And then we've seen the power of the Spirit here. Today, we're going to look at verses 19 and close out the chapter. And the title of this evening's message is, We Are Christians First. You're a Christian before you're anything else. You're a Christian before whatever uh, marital status you hold, or if you're not married, you know, it's not like, well, I'm married, or I'm single, or, you know, I have this position at work, or that. You're none of that before you're a Christian. You're a Christian first. And we have an insight here as to who the early Christians were. In the rest of chapter 11 in the book of Acts, we see where the believers are first called Christians. And it's an amazing thing because you would think that that special name or that title of privilege, really, and that's what it is, would be perhaps maybe created or originated in Jerusalem, but it wasn't. It was created and originated in a Gentile city. Now, just think of it like this. Just, I mean, I know this is probably not the best example to give, but I mean, just really think of it like this. You know, um, 
the, the only place, I guess, here in this country that we would call like uh, the most, you know, uh, dirty place, right? Uh, if I were to say this word, sin, or these words, sin city, what comes to mind? Okay, so that, that's like here in this country, that's like the worst of the worst, right? That's sin city, you know, it's all this, and yes, it is. I'm not trying to minimize that, you know, but here's the point that I'm trying to get across. So we know that basically there's so much corruption there. It's not just the casinos, it's the, um, the, 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 you know, the sex trade and all that that takes place to outrageous proportions there. I mean, prostitution is legal there. They have places that it's all legit, you know, so it's like the cesspool of the country, so to speak. And then California is like the next one with its industry in pornography. We are the state that leads in pornography. But, you know, when you think about this, it, it would, you would look at this in the days of the early church and you would say, boy, they need Jesus over there, but nobody's trying to go over there. Those places are nasty. Well, this is what happened. God tells Peter, go. Peter goes and they get saved. And then immediately there is fruit from this salvation and the gospel not only reached the Gentiles, but begin to spread continually. Now, I think everything comes back to the reminder of how and in what manner the gospel is spread. Look at verse 19. Now, those who were scattered, notice that in chapter 8 and verse 4, they were scattered then also in the Samaritan, uh, you know, um, gospel being brought to the Samaritans. They were scattered. It was the persecution that brought about this scattering of believers. Now, remember that I said this before, that persecution always serves two purposes. Number one, it separates real Christians from those that are just not real Christians. Because those that truly love the Lord will endure any type of persecution and continue to serve the Lord faithfully. And then you got those that if they're really not married to their commitment to the Lord, as soon as persecution hits, they're the ones that you, you don't see anymore. You know, some little trial is what took them out, some little funky attitude they had with somebody, and oftentimes it's somebody in the church. Uh, remember that you're not more important than Jesus, nor is any relationship that you have here in the church, so nobody should drive you out of here if you truly love the Lord. Nobody should ever get in the way of Christ in your life. But persecution separates the real from the fake. But then persecution also serves another purpose. It does a sifting among the sheep from the goat. Let's just put it that way. But persecution also scatters. In the early church, when the church was persecuted, they would scatter abroad. And what persecution did is it actually advanced the kingdom and helped the church. So when the enemy thought he was, you know, I, I got him, they're on the run. Yeah, they're on the run, but they're going to preach the gospel every step of the way. So persecution spread the gospel and the church began to grow by great proportions. So let me put it to you this way. How about when you're persecuted? Number one, it's going to tell you what you're really made of. Are you really serious about this Jesus thing you got going on here? And number two, all it's going to do is cause you to grow more in the faith. And your persecution in your life is going to cause you to go and tell others about Jesus and minister to others. And so this was very healthy for the early church. But, but notice what it goes on to say in verse 19. It says, now those who were scattered after the persecution that arose over Stephen. Now let me give you a better way to interpret the verse here. Let's put it this way. Now those who were scattered, it shouldn't be after, it should be on the account of. Stephen's persecution. So you don't really tie in chapter 11 all the way into chapter 7 and 8. The persecution of Stephen happened, and we see that at, in chapter 8, that persecution arose very greatly. The Bible says in verse 1, Now Saul was consenting to his death. This is Stephen's death. At the time, listen to this, a great persecution arose against the church, which was at Jerusalem. So this great persecution that arose was continuing on. All we did was read stories from that point on as to how God was doing a great work even when persecution was great. Let me remind you, don't run from times of persecution. God does his greatest work 
when we're in the midst of the fire. So trust the Lord. Trust God. But here's another thing we got to look at. It says here that this persecution has been great and has been continuing. It's been growing, but the church has also been growing. The persecution that arose over Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia, which is north of Judea, Cyprus, which is these Gentile cities, and Antioch. Guys, Antioch was a major pagan metropolitan place. It was, it was the metropolis of, of, of pagan worship, as a matter of fact, or metropolis. And it was the third largest city within the Roman Empire. It was 1,300 miles away from Rome, but check this out. It was so vile, worse than Rome itself, that even Antioch began to influence the city of Rome. And yet here we see that persecution, what it did was it caused the gospel to be spread all the way to these Gentile cities. Now, to bring in in chapter 11, uh, Peter's account of what took place with Cornelius, some would say that perhaps maybe there were those who were among the household of Cornelius and friends and bystanders. And remember, Peter stayed for several days at the end of chapter 10. It says, and he com uh, commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Then they asked him to stay a few days. Perhaps there were many more that got saved, were discipled, received the gospel, and guess what they did? They immediately didn't waste no time. They went out. And that's what you and I are supposed to do. When we get saved and we come to the Lord, where do we immediately begin to tell others about Jesus? That's what we do. Don't ever stop. Don't ever stop leading people to Christ. And what we see here is that by the time Paul the Apostle comes back on the scene, the Gentiles had been receiving the gospel for a period of time. Now, this is all important because remember, guys, whenever you read the book of Acts, you're reading your DNA. This is where you and I come from. The book of Acts is still continuing today. It's, it's continuing to this day. The book of Acts will finally be written and closed when the church is taken up. And so the point being made is that here's your DNA. So when people say you're a Christian and where, where does Christianity come from? Well, we know the answer to give in regards to who Jesus is and, you know, um, Christianity buds forth out of Judaism and, and here we have followers of Jesus Christ. But if they say, well, tell me a little bit about your history, we'll read the book of Acts. That's the first 30 years of our history. And so we see here that the gospel went quickly and spread. And then we see this city Antioch. Well, the Bible says that they went about preaching. It says that they traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, Antioch, preaching the word to no one but the Jews only, but some of them were men from Cyprus and Cyrene, who when they had come to Antioch, spoke to the Hellenists, preaching the Lord Jesus. Now, this is amazing here because notice, I love when it says here that some men. Now, I think that's m notable for us to kind of circle that some men. You want to know why? Because we don't know, at least at this point, who these men are. And I think that's important. We shouldn't always want to be known. We want to make Jesus known. That's what we want to do. We want to make him known. And that should be our life's purpose as Christians, to make him known. Not ourselves, not a movement, not a denomination, but Jesus. And so they went and they ministered the word of God and shared the word of God. These the Cy, uh, people of Cyprus and Cyrene, remember Cyrene, Simon of Cyrene that helped Jesus carry the cross, remember that? Um, he was uh, a black man. He was uh, from, obviously from North Africa. That's kind of the region of the people that are from Cyrene. And it says here that as they came to these regions, they spoke to the speak Greeking, or Greek speaking Jews, preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them, 
and a great number believed and turned to the Lord. So the Lord, his blessing was on them. And there's nothing like knowing that the Lord's blessing is upon you. It's, it's an amazing thing to know that God is, is really the one doing the work through you. And, and you know, it, when you look at uh, serving the Lord, you know, every day we're to serve the Lord with our lives. But, but in some cases, God will call you to take a step of faith to serve the Lord in, in perhaps maybe an area where you're not too comfortable in. But, but the Lord opens that door. And, and you want to know what? Here's what I'll tell you. You might not know everything. And you might be a little bit nervous and afraid, but just talk about Jesus, not about you, and you'll be okay. That's it. And then you say, well, I don't know what to really say about Jesus. Well, say what Jesus did in your life. Oh, you know how to talk about you, but just add Jesus in there, right? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And just say, you know, this is what I was. And be honest. Some people just say, you know, I was a pretty bad person. No, talk about how much of a dog you were. Put it that way. Then that'll get their attention because they might just be a dog too. And before you know it, they're going to look at you. They're going to say, can, God can really change a person like, like you? Hey, if he could change me, he can change anybody. There's nothing you can do or have done or will ever do that God cannot forgive you of. Now, we know the unpardonable sin is rejecting God. But they're not in that place if they're sitting and listening to you. Preach the gospel. Share the word of God. Give them Jesus. The Lord's blessing was on them. I could only imagine as they went out, they just started speaking the message of the cross, the resurrection, that Jesus came to die for their sins, that his blood was shed on Calvary's cross, that the price was paid, and then the Spirit of God, you know, ministering alongside as the Lord was, was with them as they went out. The news of these came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem. Now check this out. So now, here's what happens. Word always gets back to Jerusalem, right? So the first time that this takes place is we see when the, Gen uh, the Samaritans receive salvation. Word gets back to Jerusalem, and they're like, we need to go investigate this. Cornelius' household gets saved, and all of a sudden, word gets back to Jerusalem. They question Peter because he ate with a Gentile. And then here we see that many Gentiles begin to get saved at the preaching of the gospel, and these Jews are getting saved in these Gentile cities. The Hellenists are getting saved, and there's this great work taking place, and they're saying, man, so there's Gentiles getting saved in this dirty, filthy city, Antioch? You know, sometimes we probably limit the power of God's ability to go beyond the four walls of this church. Sometimes we feel that if we just bring somebody here to this church, then, then God might touch them. You know, that very well might happen, but don't expect the church to change your loved one. God can touch them right there before you even come here. I've seen people come to the Lord in some of the most amazing places, and it wasn't even church, and it wasn't even behind a church sermon or an invitation that was given. But you see, as these begin to share the word of God, and then there was a great response, the word came to them at Jerusalem, and then what did they do? Like they sent out Peter and John to go follow up on Philip's ministry because Samaritans were getting saved. Now they send Barnabas, it says here, to go follow up and check this whole phenomenon out in Antioch. Now they sent the right guy because Cyprus and Antioch are in the same region. And remember that Barnabas was a Jew from Cyprus. And they sent the right guy, one of their own, right? So we can send this guy. They'll see that he's from Cyprus. So they'll, they'll say, you know what? Okay, this, this, this is... He's one of us, and he's a man who was very well respected in the early church. He wasn't one of the apostles, but he was one of the leaders of the early church, and Barnabas was a man who was fully aware of what God called him to do in the early church. I love this character. Everybody talks about Barnabas 
you know, and his name, living up to his name. His name means son of encouragement. And Barnabas did go about encouraging the body. But I think Barnabas encouraged the body of Christ to a greater degree than just going and patting somebody on the back and saying, good job. I think Barnabas' obedience to the apostles, waiting as the Spirit would lead and direct. There was a sense of order. Now, yes, people are getting saved. You know, that's an exciting thing. It's like all of a sudden, you know, the business is flowing now. You know, you don't know what to do. They're popping up all over the place, you know. So you got to send the right person that has the right heart and will minister to the people and speak the right words. Barnabas in no way had a desire to do his own thing. His desire was to do the God thing. His desire was to advance the kingdom and build the body of Christ. His desire was to lead people to Jesus and also disciple them in the word of God and build them up in their faith. And in no way did Barnabas ever draw attention to himself. Barnabas was from Cyprus. That's what Acts chapter 4 verse 36 says. There are three reasons why I could say, apart from what Acts 11 says, that Barnabas was chosen to go to Antioch, number one. The good reason was that he was from Cyprus. That's the right thing to do. Send somebody there that can understand the culture and the people. That's really important. And I think that's important for us to do anytime. Doesn't necessarily mean that that will always work because God can use anything. But for the most part, that's what we set out to do when we we're trying to minister to a certain group of people, right? It's like when they, at least I'll use this situation, when people come to me and say, oh, I want my loved ones to come speak to you. Okay, so, so tell me a little bit about them. The first thing they always say is like, well, you know, they've been to prison and they were on drugs and, you know, they were in gangs. So I'm just like, okay. So, you know, it's like, I, you know, okay. I, okay, so yeah, okay. I see, I see now why you're coming to me. You know, so... <laughs> You know, that's, that's the right thing to think of, right? Because that's what they say. But, you know, I always put this, I always tell them, you know what, listen. Um, they might not listen to me. So it wasn't that type of person that led me to Christ. It was some white cowboy from Tulare that talked with a twang in his voice. David, Jesus loves you. He died for your sins, you know, so... That's who God used to lead me to. It wasn't some guy that, you know, was somebody that I'd be like, oh, wow, you were bad. This dude wasn't bad, but God used him. But you want to send the right people. It doesn't mean that God can't use anybody. But I think, listen, something you and I need to pay attention to is that the early church was not only spirit-led, but you could see that their maturity was well advancing. They begin to understand that even though the gospel was transcending culture, right? And even though the gospel was reaching the worst of the worst, Saul of Tarsus, and the people of Antioch, even though the gospel was doing all this, they realized, you know, it's probably good if we send so-and-so. And I believe that came from the Lord. So I think in some cases, take note of this, that in areas of ministry, there needs to be a sense of maturity and a sense of strategic planning. There are two types of models in which churches are planted. One is intentional, and the other is unintentional. An intentional church plant would be to gather a group of people and prep them all for supporting a, a man who's going to be the pastor of this Bible study that's going to start. And then it's intentional. People start to handle their affairs. They pay off their credit cards. They pay off all their debt. Some of them put their homes up for sale and they all move, sometimes upwards of about 50 people. They all move to the city where this gentleman's going to start a Bible study group. And that's intentional. And they commit to three, four years to live in that city, work in that area, so that this guy can plant a church with 50 people. It happens that way. It's intentional. Most church planting organizations have some type of church planting model that follows that. Then there's unintentional, where it's just kind of like, you know what? I just went over there to meet with this couple. 
I opened up the Bible, prayed with them, shared with them. Before you know it, they asked me to come back the following week. I went back. They had relatives there. And the next thing you know, this thing just began to grow. And then you see the hand of God upon the individual that is doing this. And, and, and then you see that this was unintentional. And boom, a work is birthed. And oftentimes, many feel that they're called to go out, but many don't make it. I'm often reminded early on in a year, about, about 2009, you know, uh, about a year after I became the senior pastor of this Bible study group that I planted with, and, and this was unintentional. And then about maybe two years into this Bible study, it became intentional. I realized like th this is going to be a church. Okay, what do I do now? Right? But when I went to the pastor's conference, there was, you know, I don't know, 20 some hundred senior pastors or pastors and assistant pastors and just all these guys. And then like everybody you listen to on the radio was there. They're like, hey, there goes. Hey. But the, the guy was like, no, don't do that. Don't do that. Mom. Like, it's, 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 this ain't the place for. And it's like, oh, all right. But they, they're, they're so yeah, don't look over there. All right. All right. You know, and it's like, you know, and then and then you see. And then for me, you know, it, it's like um, really encouraging, and exciting. But then, you know, at that time, I already knew Pastor Chuck. And had already met with him and, and, and sat with him. And he knew who I was and what I was doing. And, and then to see him up there and teach all these guys and see that all these men were, 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 were influenced by Pastor Chuck. It was an amazing thing. But I'll never forget a couple of things that Pastor Chuck shared. And this is the, this is the truth. The first one I went to, he said, he says, we are Calvary Chapel. And we have no desire to be influenced by any other denomination or movement. And if you desire to be that, then go ahead and leave Calvary Chapel because we don't want to be that. I was like, ooh, that's good. My kind of guy. Second thing he began to say was he began to talk on the topic because, you know, there was people trying to make changes in Calvary and this, this and that and doing their own thing. So basically he just says, you can, you're just not going to do it here. So Go do it with the ones that you're hooking up with, that you kind of like their vibe. Go, God bless them. Do what you got to do. I love that. Then the other thing was he began to talk on the topic of people getting too carried away with their title. And he told all those pastors, he goes, I know that this is the senior pastor's conference, but I love what he said. You know, there's only one senior pastor and his name's Jesus. Oh, boy. I was like, this guy, yes, I love this. Then he started talking on the nature of all these churches that went out. He says, you know, it's usually about the second year that I get a phone call in my office by this young man that felt called to go out. And he's saying, he says, it never fails. Right around the two-year mark, I want to come home. It's not working out. It's hard ground. You know, there's this, there's that, you know, and, and, he, and he's just kind of laying out all the scenarios he's heard. And then, then he tells him, well, listen, it, it, you could either stay and watch what God will do or you can come back. It's up to you. And the ones that stayed, their ministries just exploded after that year. You know, and so I always realized that one of the marks that he said, listen, you know, there's, there's a need for those to go and to make themselves available to disciple and minister to others. And though it's an exciting thing, there's a couple of things that are required. Number one, like I said here, there was good reason for Barnabas to go because, you know, he was from Cyprus. So, in other words, he had the ability to minister to that group of people. So, point number one, having the ability to minister to this group of people. Number two... The Bible says in Acts chapter 4 and verse 37 that he was a very generous man. He had wealth, but he was generous. He was a giver. He was a giver. you got to have a heart to give, not a greedy heart. And number three, not only was he a man who encouraged, but he was a gracious man. Acts chapter 4 and verse 36, he was a gracious man. In Acts chapter 11 and verse 24, he was gracious. So we see here that he was from uh, Cyprus. We see that uh, he was generous. We see that he was gracious. This is why Barnabas was sent to go and speak. This, 
you got to send the right person. And, and it's not so much that Barnabas proved himself that he was a very spiritual man. Barnabas was just real. This is not some strong apostle with, you know, this whole theological background. This was a man who had a love for souls and a desire to see people to come and know Christ and no one else. That's it. He didn't have his teachings. He didn't say, oh, I know why they're sending me. I got some pretty good Bible studies that I've been working on. No. You know, they're sending me because, you know, I'm the guy. Unbeknownst to Barnabas, as, as Gentiles are getting saved and this is brewing, God is preparing this through the leadership there in Jerusalem. And they send Barnabas for this reason. The Bible says here, when he came and he had seen the grace of God, that means salvation coming to the Gentiles, he was glad. Notice that. He wasn't like them other ones in the beginning of the chapter that are telling Peter, what are you doing eating with them stinking Gentiles, man? Barnabas says, this just goes to show you his heart. He was glad. The Bible says here, and encourage them all with, or that, with purpose of heart that they should continue with the Lord. Imagine that. Here he comes. They send him like they sent Peter and John earlier to Samaria. They send Barnabas here to the Gentiles. And then it goes on to say in verse 24 that this is what he did, but look it, for he was. This is why, and this is how he encouraged them. He was a good man. Listen, let, let me tell you something. What would the scripture say of us? Because what really matters is what God says of you. And this is what the Lord had to say about Barnabas. The Lord, through the word of God, is saying that he was a good man, that he was full of the Holy Spirit, and of faith, full of the Spirit, full of faith, and he was a good man. And a great many people were added to the Lord. Notice how it says they were added to the Lord. What does that mean? That his ministry was fruitful. That people were being discipled, that they were being encouraged, that they were being built up. Then Barnabas departed for Tarsus to seek Saul. Can you imagine that as Barnabas got there, here's a couple of things that he realized. Number one, he knew that the people in Antioch that were getting saved and coming, this is like who everybody wants to be a part of a great revival, right? Like you just want to see all kinds of people come to faith. He realized the moment he got there as he's discipling and he's in the trenches with them and he's encouraging them and he's, he's building them up in the faith. He realized, I can't do all this by myself. And he thought, man, what guy would be good? Saul of Tarsus. Because he was the one that introduced Saul to the Believers, remember that? They were, they were afraid of Saul. They're like, hey, you heard some things about this guy. Are you sure, Barnabas? He's like, he's good, man, he's good. But this was Barnabas' heart. He had so much respect among the early church that when he brought Saul, they were afraid of Saul, but they respected Barnabas' maturity and humility and his graciousness. That they said, if he's with Barnabas, and Barnabas is saying he's good, imagine having that type of reputation. Where here you have a man who was murdering and persecuting the church. We read it. We've seen it. And all of a sudden, all it takes is for Barnabas to say, he's a good guy. That's how much the church respected and honored Barnabas. And with that much respect and honor, they told Barnabas, go to this dirty city. Because dirty Gentiles are getting saved. And Barnabas looks at it and doesn't say at all that it's beneath him. I would love to go. So here's this, here's this, 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 this Greek-speaking Jew, right? He, he goes over there and he begins to minister to them, right? And, and, and he's able to get the lingo down. You know, he's from Cyprus. He's able, to, he's able to talk to both groups and he's ministering there among them. And he begins to say, man, you know, I, I know a guy that would be good here. Listen, Barnabas knew he couldn't do it all by himself. That's a way to do ministry. Barnabas wasn't handing it off to Saul and saying, here, you take it now. No, Barnabas was saying, listen, I'm being blessed by this great work. I can only imagine how many others would be blessed by this work. And so within his own heart, it seems evident here that he sought Saul because he knew that Saul would be a great fit. But I believe this was all by the Lord's timing. So look at what happens here. So Barnabas departed for Tarsus to seek Saul. Now, according to Philippians chapter 3 and verse 8, Paul, writing to the Philippians, stated in this very verse that he had been mistreated and actually kind of pushed out by his own countrymen. 
It seems that perhaps in verse 25, that Barnabas' desire to seek out Saul of Tarsus was, yes, in one point ministerial, but in another point, Barnabas was led by the Spirit. In this period of time in which Saul's departure takes place, remember, guys, that the last time we hear of Saul of Tarsus is in chapter 9, and he's actually departing. He's actually leaving to Caesarea. And they brought him down to Caesarea and then sent him out to Tarsus. That's in chapter 9 in verse 30. And we don't hear of Saul of Tarsus no more. As a matter of fact, in verse 32, it says now Peter's on the scene. So let me give you guys a little bit so you can calculate. Because people have asked the question, how much time elapsed from chapter 9 and chapter 11. Now remember, look at verses 23 through 25 of chapter 9 very quickly. It says, Now after many days were passed, the Jews plotted to kill him. This is after his conversion. This is after Saul preaches Christ. The Bible says in verse 20, immediately he preached Christ. He didn't wait. He didn't go to seminary. He didn't go, you know, get ordained or anything like that. He went and immediately began to preach Christ. And all those who heard were amazed. And they said, isn't this a guy who used to destroy those uh, who were Christians? And, and, and he would go and, and he would persecute them. And the Bible says Saul increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews who, who dwelt at Damascus, proving that Jesus is the Christ. That was important, that he proved that Jesus is the Messiah. Okay, now look at what happens. Verse 23, now after many days. This is where we believe when Paul wrote, listen, Galatians chapter 1 in verse 17, he says that he received from the Lord for three years. He was in the deserts of Arabia. We believe that took place between verses 22 and 23 of chapter 9. Because there's no other place where you can fit it. Now why? Just jot this down in your notes. Put three years. So we know three years just in chapter 9 alone in Paul's earlier conversion. Now, it's an interesting thing. Remember when Paul wrote to the Corinthian church... In 1 Corinthians, in chapter 11, in verse 23, he says, For I will deliver unto you that which was delivered unto me. This is Paul saying this. I will deliver unto you that which was delivered unto me. And then he talks about what Jesus quoted in Matthew 26, in starting in verse 26, when the Bible says that Jesus took the bread. He gave thanks. He broke it. He gave it to the disciples. He said, take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Then in the same manner, he took the cup. He said, this is my cup of my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. And then he goes on to say, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until I drink it anew with you in my father's kingdom. And then the Bible says that they sang hymns. And then they went on. Jesus went into the garden of Gethsemane. Paul says, I will deliver unto you that which was delivered unto me. That in the same night in which Jesus was betrayed... Then he begins to go through Matthew 26, and he's reiterating communion 30 years after Jesus instituted it in Matthew 26. 30 years went by. But he said he received it from the Lord, most likely in the deserts of Arabia. There were many things that Paul experienced that he received firsthand knowledge in some ways in saying that it was revealed to him by Jesus. We believe that perhaps this is what took place in this time in which he had with the Lord. Now, coming now to chapter 11, it says here that Barnabas went to seek him in Tarsus. Now, the question has been asked, how much time has passed from chapter 9 to chapter 11? We believe about 10 years have passed already. So this means that with those three years and these 10 years, Saul of Tarsus has been off the scene in and around Jerusalem for 13 years now. So many people get excited about the book of Acts, and they're like, hey, you want to know what? It's all about signs and wonders, man. You know, if, if, if you ain't got signs and wonders taking place at your church, you're not a spirit-filled church. Why? Because people ain't doing this weird junk that people attribute to the Holy Spirit that's not found in Scripture? No, I don't think so. Well, haven't you ever read the book of Acts? I mean, people were being healed and the dead was being raised. Well, the book of Acts is written over a period of 30 years. Now take all those miracles and spread them over a period of 30 years. Were they happening back to back over and up? No. I said, okay, then get your history straight. So we got 15, 13 to 15 years, perhaps, that took place here. And Saul is getting ministered to for three years in the deserts of Arabia. And now, what happened perhaps in this time? Because after we see that now Saul 
begins with Barnabas. Guys, listen, we have the rest of Paul's Christian testimony till the book of Acts closes out. So remember when he said, in perils of my own countrymen, remember that? In 2 Corinthians, remember when he begins to talk about, in chapter 11, about his testimony, everything that he went through, remember that? Shipwrecked and, and left for naked, and he says, and left for dead, he was whipped 39 times, minus one, you know, kind of thing, and he begins to say all these things, and how about in, uh, what is it, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, when he talks about going up to the third heaven, remember that? And all these experiences that he had, this revelation in 2 Corinthians 12 also, all these things, and what we see here that Saul could have very well have already been ministering to Gentiles up until this point. He could have already been leading Gentiles to the Lord, and this is probably why Barnabas wanted to go seek him out. He says it out of his own mouth in Acts chapter 22 in verses 17 through 21. This could very well be the point in which he was doing this. This could be the point in which all these experiences that he had happened during this 13 to 15 year time frame. And look at what happens here. It goes on to say this. So Barnabas departed, and when he had found out, he had brought him to Antioch. Why did he bring him? Because perhaps this is where he had been persecuted by his own. And so... It was, the Bible says, that for a whole year they assembled with the church and taught a great many people. Can you imagine that? Barnabas and Saul now spend a year discipling these Gentile believers and these believers that are getting saved. And here they are, guys. They're, they're, they're ministering to them. They're pouring into them. You can imagine they're blown away by Saul of Tarsus' testimony. And the Bible says in this time in which this revival was breaking out and many were getting saved, the Bible says a great many people and the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. You see the word Christian, what it means is it means belonging to the party of. Belonging to the party of Christ because guess what? They, they, Paul and Barnabas, they didn't say, hey, call us Christians because that's what we are. You know, you want to be known by this, you know. No, they're just talking about Jesus. They talk so much about Jesus Christ that they said, these are followers of Christ, Christians. They belong. Now, this wasn't like a cool term, okay? They were called that because it was a derogatory term. Those are the Christians. And some people look at this and they say, yes, you know, I'm a Christian. <laughs> but remember that that wasn't a very popular term. As a matter of fact, it was a very derogatory term, Acts chapter 26 and verse 28. And in 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 16, it was Peter who said that Christians suffer. They suffer persecution. There is a cost that comes with being a Christian. You guys know that the first time the word Christian was given to the church was not to the Jewish believers wasn't to the Samaritan. Now remember, the Samaritans, they're still, you know, they're, they're half Jew and, and, and Assyrian, Gentile. So they were, they were still kind of had their foot in the door with the Jews. The Jews weren't too offended by Samaritans receiving the Holy Spirit. But boy, when Cornelius started speaking in tongues, they flipped a lid, man. But it's amazing to see that the Lord was showing, if we look at the Jews in the most purest sense, yes, salvation is of the Jews, and then you would say, well, yeah, but then you got the Samaritans that are half Jew and half Gentile, so to speak. And then you just got all of a sudden just Gentile. So it goes from like holy to unholy. What the Lord is saying is, my gospel is not just for those who claim to be righteous, but my gospel is for all who will receive. This is why you have so many passages that say all and many and whosoever because this is what it's about. So you can imagine these new Christians, they're blown away, you know, and tell us about this Jesus. It's, that's one of the things that excites me about baby Christians. They're like baby rattlesnakes, man. <laughs> baby rattlesnakes will jack you up quick. They, they, don't, they have no control of their venom. They bite you, you're done, right? But, but, but a baby Christian, the same way, they just, they, just, they just give you everything. 
And they might not even hit it right. I, I think it's cute when they come up and they're like, you know, remember when Paul said, you know, um, blessed are the poor in spirit. And you're like, that was Jesus, Matthew 5. But they don't care. They're excited. They're excited. You know, they, remember when he said that? And I just go, yeah, yeah, I remember. Yeah, you know. And they're like, well, you know, and I told him this. And he said, yes to Jesus. Can you believe? It's like, wow. Like, I remember when I used to be, you didn't care. You knew what was there. They're, they're all the same. You know what I mean? It's like Paul, Peter, whoever. But you know one of them said it, right? The Holy Spirit said it. How about that? You know, but, but the whole thing is they're excited. They're motivated. They want to go win. You remember when you were like that? Anybody here? Then all of a sudden our prejudices set in. The honeymoon's over. And then we got like a year or two into this, and all of a sudden now we are the voice for God. We are the only interpreters of Scripture. And then we start to get offended because they say, remember when Peter said, blessed are the poor in spirit. That wasn't Peter. That was Jesus. Go read your Bible. You start becoming a Christian. Well, you, know, you know what? You start becoming an individual like that. God is not pleased. Your, 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 your spirituality, it's like the Pharisees. It's no spirituality at all. It's, it's, it's self-word. And let me tell you something. Not only is it that, you're supposed to be a sweet aroma. You're not a sweet aroma. You're a stench. You smell like a junior high boy's locker room. That's what you smell like. And everything that you offer up to the Lord in that pride and arrogance, God doesn't receive it. I love when new Christians go to Israel for the first time. It's amazing to see that because they're near new Christians and they're just like, I can't believe I'm here. And they call it the Holy Land. It's not really the Holy Land, but they call it that. They're excited. Just let them, just, just let them go. They want to get in the water. It could be freezing cold. All clothes on, <laughs> iPhone in their pocket. You know, they forget. You know, they're trying to, you know, it's like, it's crazy. It's like, let them, just let them. This, this, this. It's fun to watch. They're so excited. Amazing. And you want to know what? Yeah, they might get you in a lot of trouble, okay? But... <laughs> You need a little bit of that in your Christianity when it was all about Jesus and not about you. Can you remember what it was like when you first got, you didn't care about you anymore. It was like it's all about Jesus. Now it's about us. Can you imagine what this first year with all these new believers was like? And, 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 and Saul, guys, listen. Being saved about 13 years now, walking with Jesus, all this stuff that God was dealing with him and, 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 and everything that he once believed. And, and now this revelation of Jesus and, and he's pouring into these young disciples and, and all of a sudden the church is growing. And yeah, we're Christians. We are Christians. We're followers of Jesus. Not only were they growing, but the church was growing. They belonged to the party of Jesus. The Bible says in these days, prophets came from Jerusalem. To, can you imagine? The, not the prophets, but prophets came. What does this mean? Now, some people would say, well, well, then that means that there's prophets in this day. Well, no, the Bible gives order to this. The term here, prophets, mean those that were endowed with the gift of prophecy. It is an actual gift in the scriptures. Now, this is why I have issue with some that say that the gifts ceased with the apostles. Well, these men that came from Jerusalem, they were not apostles. They were just men who exercised the gift of prophecy. So if only apostles exercised prophecy, and if the gifts, if the gifts ceased with the gifts that the apostles practiced only, then what about these non-apostles who exercised these gifts also? It wasn't just for the apostles, it was for the church. And so they came to or from Jerusalem to Antioch. Then one of them named Agabus stood up and showed by the spirit that there was going to be a great famine throughout all the world. And that would mean the known world of their day, which also happened in the days of Claudius Caesar. Now, we know that Calgula came after Claudius Caesar, and some would say, well, that great famine happened during the reign of Calgula. But we also see that during the reign of Claudius Caesar that there was a lot of various famines, and history tells us that, you know, he was kind of pushed out because of these things. But then we also see that he pushed a lot of Jews. He expelled them from Rome. You'll see that several chapters later. But 
this famine was prophesied and spoken of that this thing would take place. And what it did was it prepared the church for the famine that would take place ahead. Oftentimes when these things happened in Roman cities and um, throughout the Roman Empire, the Christians were always blamed and persecuted. So the point being made was that persecution is going to rise and we're going to be blamed for this famine in some way. Be ready. Be ready. But who were these that prophesied? Well, these men occupied most likely a teaching office in the church because that's where prophecy comes from. It comes from this teaching office and these were men that were under the tutelage of Barnabas. That's what Acts chapter 13 and verse 1 reveals to us. That there were certain men, prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius Cyrene, uh, of Cyrene, Menian, who had been brought up with the Herod, the Tetrarch, and Saul. They ministered. You see, these men also had teaching. So there's no such thing as a person saying, oh, well, you know, I'm a prophet. No, you're either a preacher or teacher. And some people preach and teach. And you exercise these gifts in the preaching and teaching of the Word of God. And sometimes people emphasize the gifts more than Jesus. And, you know, at the end of the day, the Bible gives us a clear, clear guide to follow what the gifts are and how they apply to our lives today as Christians. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 13, and 14. And it's in chapter 12, right around the second verse, where Paul says, Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I do not want you to be ignorant. And it's an interesting thing, because this is what the early church exercised. Guys, listen, there was, there was people being healed, people being raised from the dead, people hearing about Jesus, miracles were happening, signs and wonders were taking place, guys. People were being baptized, people were coming to faith, all kinds of things were, the least likeliest people were coming to know Christ as Lord and Savior. And then you got guys like Barnabas and Saul who are ministering to a bunch of Gentiles who are getting saved and they're just coming to Jesus Christ. And then you got prophets now from Jerusalem coming and they are ministering among them. Guys, listen, you see the gifts in full power here. And, and sometimes people look at all this and they see just like this great confusion, like it was just a free-for-all in the spirit. No, it wasn't. There was order. Barnabas just didn't go to Antioch because he wanted to, and I, I hear from the Lord, so I'm going to do whatever I want to do. No, he was sent. He was sent. Oftentimes, people like doing their own thing. You've got to be sent. Who sent you? You know, it's an interesting thing because when you look at the book of Acts, they established order from the very start. The apostles were the original 12 minus Judas Iscariot who walked with Jesus. So I don't know if you guys noticed that the apostles that did write, not all the apostles wrote books of the Bible in the New Testament, but the ones that did, Whenever they were going to bring a correction to the group that they were writing to, listen to this. They always put their title in there, an apostle of Jesus Christ. Not by the will of man, but ordained by God to be an apostle. They always put that. They're saying, listen, I'm not trying to throw my title around, but this letter, as it's going to be read, the question's going to be asked, number one, who are you correcting us? If it's just some you know, Joe Schmo down the street, well then, your, your word is not from the Lord. But if it's an apostle ordained by Christ Jesus, then we know that the apostles hear from the Lord. And this is why they would put the title apostle, because they had what was called the apostolic authority. And it was always the title. Pay attention when you read the New Testament. The title was always used when they were going to bring correction. Because it was the apostles that corrected. And then you see here that Barnabas was not an apostle, but he was a respected elder in the early church. And what they did was they sent him, just like they sent Peter and John to go check out the work. They were sent. Peter and John didn't go on their own. They were sent. Here's the point I'm trying to make. Within the body of Christ in the early church, there's a pecking order. Jesus showed us the pecking order in his earthly ministry. He says, I only come to do what the Father has sent me to do. 
And it's funny how Christians today, listen, I meet them. There's some here in this church. There might even be some sitting here tonight. (laughs) I feel sorry for you. Anyways, they say things like, you know, I hear from God and he told me to do this. Be very careful. Be very careful. Jesus heard from the Father and he obeyed his will. Jesus said, ask anything in my name. Our pecking order comes under Jesus. And then when the church was birthed, Jesus said, your pecking order comes under the apostles. Then the apostles told the elders, go and appoint certain leaders in the church. There's always a flow and a pecking order. And that's when God honors and blesses things. You never go outside of the biblical pecking order. You might get a wild spiritual hair and say, I heard from God. That is a very intimidating statement because you just said right now that God spoke directly to you. So whatever comes out of your mouth better be from the Lord. If not, God will deal with you. So don't say you heard from God because you had pepperoni the night before and you got heartburn and all of a sudden I feel it. I feel it in here. It's I'm feeling it. No, go burp, relax. Take some Prilosec, do something, you know, take it easy, pray, seek the Lord. If you've heard from God, you don't have to tell people you heard from the Lord. Now, some of you ain't hearing me. You don't have to tell somebody that. If God's really leading you and directing you to an individual, the Lord's already revealed to them. And it flows. This is what I think the Lord's leading us to do. We should pray about this. And then God honors it and blesses it. When I read this, I'm so blessed because it's like, man, you know, this could easily get out of hand and you could have all kinds of people doing all kinds of crazy. Don't you guys just see it? If you guys are thinking like two or three people got saved, you're like, you know, it's kind of cool. And you're like five people. No, you're, you're talking a couple of thousand. Church is growing in in great numbers. I mean, think about it. The church was 120 strong on the day of Pentecost, right? And then Peter preaches this sermon and 3,000 souls are added to the church. Now the church just grew from one sermon to 3,120. And then by the time the Samaritans get saved, now the church is over 5,000 strong. This is just within the first couple of months of the gospel going out. So you can imagine up by this time, the church has already grown to great proportions And they're not like discipling one or two guys. You know, Paul and Barnabas, guys, they have probably perhaps a couple of hundred guys they're working with. So they're they're teaching them the word of God. They're teaching them the doctrines of Jesus Christ. And and they're they're breaking it all down to them. They're taking time with them. They're They're answering their questions. What are they doing it for? Not to create a following after themselves, but to create lovers of Jesus. That's it. Lovers of Jesus. So there was this great order in the church. And the reason why, you might say, why are you talking about this pecking order? Well, let me tell you, if you're reading, you'll see why. And some of you that know the Bible will know that this closing of this chapter is a very important closing of the chapter. It says that these prophets came and they came and they gave this word. These men were, were endowed with the gift of prophecy. Guys, you know how amazing this gift is? But it is a gift. Romans chapter 12 and verse 6. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 10. Teach that this is a gift, like Acts 13 says, that also has with it tied the teaching of the word of God. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 8, in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 11, that these are gifts of the Holy Spirit. So these men were led by the Spirit. Can I go back to this point, guys, and just explain this to you, that if you want to see God move in your life mightily, then don't quench or grieve the Holy Spirit. You can do both. And when you do, the Bible warns you. It says don't do that because you will be ineffective spiritually. And it goes on to say here that they stood up and showed by the Spirit. Notice that it's always by the Spirit, not by their knowledge. Not, and it wasn't like this weird kooky thing. They just spoke. Hey, this is what's going to happen. And the Bible says this. Then the disciples, listen to this, each according to his ability, determined to send relief to the brethren dwelling in Judea. What did they say? Then you want to know what? We need to prepare for this. 
We need to, we need to gather a collection together and we need to start to, to, to store up ahead and send to Jerusalem. That way, when, when they're affected by this famine, we've already taken care of it. You see, they were in one mind and one accord. And because this leader from Jerusalem came and said, this is what's going to happen, he created that space for them now to respond to God's word. And then they presented this, and look at what happens. Look at verse 30. This, listen to this. This, you see the word this? It's talking about their desire to put together a collection to help the church in Jerusalem. This they also did and sent it to the elders. Who did they send it to? Why is this important? I figured nobody would know. But this is the first time the word elder is ever used. And from this point on, you'll see it used throughout the book of Acts. It just demonstrated that an eldership was already established in the early church. Who are elders? Elders. Oh, there are people that try to carry themselves like elders, but you got to be ordained as an elder. You have to be appointed, not self, but by church leadership. There was a flow. The elders approved of it by the hands of Barnabas and Saul. This is the first time it's used in the book of Acts and will be used, continued on throughout the book of Acts. Acts chapter 20 and verse 17 Philippians chapter 1 and verse 1, and then we see in Titus chapter 1 and verse 5 and verse 7. I love what Paul tells Titus. He, he tells him, he says, you know, go and appoint elders. Go and ordain elders. He leaves Titus in Crete, and he's saying, go and appoint them. And then Titus is like, do you know what these Cretans are like? They're gluttons. They're sinners. They're, they're all jacked up. And Paul's like, okay, well, go find some elders from that group of guys. He had an interesting job, but the Lord blessed it, and they were appointed. And what was the purpose of the appointment of elders? Guys, listen, this is really important for us to understand, because these are the ones that shape and lead the church. These are the ones that God has appointed. There's no such thing as a self-appointed individual. None whatsoever. Oh, you got a lot of people that want to do their own thing, but that does not fall in line with the early church. There's a flow that we follow. There's a reason why. Let, let me put it to you this way. There's so much, some people say, well, you know, it, the church seems too, like, organized. I'm tired of organized religion. No, no, listen. We have an order here that I don't think that's bad. We don't allow kids in the sanctuary. There's a reason why. Because right now, if there was kids in here and they were making any type of noise and running around, you would be looking at the kids and not listening to the message. And I'm not saying this about anybody in here in particular, but most people that sit in a Bible study on a Wednesday night, Sunday morning, or Sunday night for that matter, most of the time only open their Bibles when they're sitting in church. Here's your opportunity to read. We don't want you distracted. We want you taught. So there's order. Now, we allow nursing mothers to sit in at the, si at the first sound, or side of sound or whatever the case might be, take them out to the foyer for a little bit and then come back in after you quiet them down. We understand. It's not a very large sanctuary. We hear everything that's going on. You barely hear the door open back there. Everybody turns around to see who's coming in. Who cares? <laughs> you know, listen, guys, there's order. The ushers tell you to sit in a specific place. That's order. <laughs> I, I feel bad for the ushers. Nobody ever listens to them. I just see people walk right past them, ignore them. And say, well, I tell you, <laughs> there's an order. And if you can't follow order, then your worship is not worship at all. It's not. Because you're just showing the Lord, I don't really care for the order you have here in the church. And it's the truth. It's the truth. And I'll tell you guys what, I came from a church, they, they, they allowed kids in the sanctuary. It didn't matter. They had children's church, but half the time the kids didn't want to go. We'd be sitting in church, there'd be kids going into the pews from the back all the way to the front while the pastor was teaching. You know, the parent trying to chase them, you know, and get under there, you know, and the ushers would take them out and, and you know, and, and discipline them. <laughs> oh, they did. 
<laughs> the church I grew up in, the ushers din disciplined the kids in the church. They used to try to discipline me. And my mom, <laughs> it, don't, you guys can laugh all you want. My mom's here to testify. I, I, I made ushers leave the church. It's not funny. They were crying. They're like, we don't want to come here no more. We ain't going to tithe here no more. We're out of here. Them kids are out of control. I tell you, you're out of control. Look at you. You're the adult. I'm the kid. Man up. Well, you know, I'm, 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 I'm going to hit you. You hit me, I'm going to tell my dad. I'm like, I'll get my dad on you. My dad will come over here and knock you out. I used to tell him stuff like that. Then the ladies would come in. Oh, mijo, you know, I just love you. Man, your breast stinks, man. Get out of here. <laughs> I, I'm telling you guys. <laughs> I was ruthless as a kid, man. They didn't want me in the children's ministry. You know, my mom would cry. She'd be pulling her head out. Oh, God, why? These little kids, why? You know, so. <laughs> so I got, like, so much respect for the ushers in the church because, you know, I, I was one of those difficult people they had to deal with. I was just a kid, though. I was about, you know, seven, eight years old at the time. But there has to be order. And I love what... Paul tells Timothy in Timothy, in 1 Timothy chapter 5. I, I love this. Paul always has to establishing proper order in the church. And this is why I like how this part includes Saul of Tarsus. And all of a sudden we hear about elders for the first time. This was like Saul's niche. Paul later. Saul here. But anyways, look at what he says. I love this. In 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 17. Check this out. It says this, let the elders who rule well be counted worthy of double honor. Does anybody know what that means? That means that double honor, counted worthy, means that the elders should be paid in the church. Oh, he's going to pick up an offering tonight. No, I'm not. Don't worry about it. <laughs> now listen to this. Listen to this. Especially those who labor in the word and doctrine. Now stop. Let me point something out to you because... Most people don't even pay attention to this. How many elders are spoken of in verse 17? Anybody? How many? You guys didn't know. Okay. Well, let me tell you. I'm glad you asked. Here we go. Number one, jot this down. Important for you to pay attention to. Let the elders who rule. There's one type of elder. Ruling elders. There are ruling elders in the church. That's all they're ordained for, is to help lead and bring direction in the church. They're appointed to specifically do that. They are not preacher teachers. They are ruling elders. Then he goes on to say, they'll be count, uh, well be counted worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in word and doctrine. Teaching elders. Ruling elders, teaching elders. That's why we have elders in the church that are teaching elders. And we have elders in the church that are called elders, but they don't teach. They're ruling elders. 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 17. You might say, I thought we said this is about them being paid. It sure does. It says, for Scripture says, you shall not muzzle an ox while it treads out the grain. In other words, don't put a muzzle on the ox when he's working the field. Take the muzzle off so he can eat while he's working. In other words, those that teach, those that are elders in the church, let them be taken care of by the church. So those that teach the word of God and faithfully teach the word of God to the church should receive monetary payment from the church. As a matter of fact, it says to pay those who have blessed you with the teaching of the word of God. It doesn't mean you come and give me money. How this works is... When tithes and offerings come into the church, the board of elders, both ruling and teaching elders and deacons, decide what the pastor receives. The pastor doesn't decide at all. His elders decide for him. This is what we feel the church could afford. This is what we feel we could give you. And so the pastor's like, thank you. No. Anyways, <laughs> praise God. He should be happy no matter what they offer to give. Because it's what the Lord put on their heart. And, you know, we've been blessed in this church that we didn't have to have all these meetings about pastor being paid because I work a full-time job. 
So I make my own money. I'm a tent maker by trade, like Paul, teaching the word of God, providing his own way. And the church has provided throughout the years and has helped me out faithfully because there's a part of that that, yes, they do take care of me. But the day will come when I will be the full-time pastor of this church. Right now, I'm a part-time pastor, employment-wise. But every year when my board tries to hire me, and some of you board members know, I always say no. <laughs> hire somebody else. Create another position in the church. Because right now I'm young, I can still work. I know the day is going to come when i got to say bye to that job and commit myself full-time to this. But right now my job does not interfere with me being a pastor and working here. So I'm young. I could still do it. I'm not lazy. I didn't become a pastor so the church can take care of me. I became a pastor because God called me and he gave me the gift of preaching and teaching the word. And so I've just been doing it. And when the Lord says it's done, it's over, then it's done and it's over. But right now, it's just, let's just get to it. So you have here this, verse 19. Here's the better one. I love this one of my favorite verses. You ready for this? Do not receive an accusation against an elder except from two or three witnesses. You know how many people violate this? Especially those people that call you and say, hey, and they're talking about one of your elders in the church, and they say, well, I heard this. this. Oh, is that right? So now there's people in the church gossiping about elders in the church. You've just went against Scripture. You need to repent. You're in sin if you've done this. You just worked against God's order in the church, and your Christian walk will not be fruitful if you're causing dissension in the body of Christ. The elders were brought to bring order to the church. Elders are not perfect. And 100% of the time, they're not qualified. God doesn't call the qualified. He qualifies the called. And just like God worked out in Peter after he had already received the Lord and he was already an apostle of the early church and dealt with the prejudices of his heart, after all this happened and he was appointed as a leader, so God deals with the issues of elders' hearts. And this is why sometimes some, the Bible then will go on to say, what, you read a little bit further, what does it say? Don't also put hands on anybody too quickly. And you know, sometimes there are people that God is raising up, we see it, and they're ready for that, the ordination, they're ready, but we stop, we have to wait, because we see the Lord showing us some things. It doesn't change what God already showed us. The Lord is saying, you got to give it some more time, because... They're not ready for it. They're not. But you got to trust. And it's so funny because the elders are there to lead the church and help. And guys, listen, nobody's perfect, but let me tell you something. I'm going to share this and I'm going to close. I could talk on this all night and I have a lot to say about this, but I'd rather teach this to pastors and assistant pastors because they can handle this. Most of the time, laity in the church, if you already have issues with one of the leaders in the church, this just flies over your head because you have no desire to receive from the Lord. But let me put it to you this way. Let me give you guys an example with me. Anytime I meet people and they say, I know you hear from God. I, 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 don't, I don't tune in. Because 100% of the time, they only believe I hear from God when I'm saying everything they like. But the moment... I say something that they don't like, I don't hear from God no more. I don't know what's wrong with Pastor David. He's, mi he's missing it. He's off. You know, he's, not, he's like, so do you really believe I hear from the Lord or do you not? And I never said, hey, I hear from God. You should listen to me. It's often been said. I believe the Lord's leading us in this direction. I believe this is what the word says. I know that the day is going to come when I will be held accountable for every word that's come out of my mouth. I know that. that. That there's a verse that speaks directly to me and tells me that. But there's a verse that also speaks to you the same thing. You will be held accountable for what you've said against the elders of the church. Be very careful. If you have an issue with an elder... Speak to the chief elder, the Lord God, and pray, and pray. That's the best thing to do. 
God's faithful. Remember, it's his church. You didn't die for it. Jesus did. And he invited you. <laughs> oh, boy. As jacked up as we were, he invited us and said, I want you to come and be a part of this. <laughs> you didn't deserve it. Oh, yes, I did. I know why he called me here. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Listen. There's not a day that goes by, church, that I don't ever think in my mind that I can easily be removed from being the pastor of this church. It's not my church. It's his. You're not my people. You're his. I understand that. But when God brings leaders in the church, they're there to lead. And if you ever expect to be used by God, if you ever want any type of authority, we already talked about what authority looks like in the Bible. John chapter 13, I taught you guys this on Sunday. If you ever want any type of authority to do a work for the Lord, you first have to learn how to be under it. And if you can't be under it, the Lord will never give it to you. It won't happen. It will not happen. And those that abuse their authority, God will deal with them. He sure will. So, I thank the Lord that he didn't just say, oh, I didn't realize this many people were going to get saved. No, God was prepared. He raised up the right people. Not perfect. Was Peter perfect? He was a prejudiced man and God still used him. I'm just blown away how we as Christians can read stories in the Bible and be like, wow, God, you're so David. Wow, King, King David. If David were alive today, if I was King David and I committed adultery on my wife, and I murdered her husband. Listen, and I murdered the husband of the wife that I committed adultery with. Would you still come to this church if I was the pastor? Hello? Don't get all spiritual here. Be honest. Would you come, yes or no? Would you expect God to use me ever again? Oh, yeah, because you know God's heart, and you know what God wants. You're wrong. God still used David. He still remained the king of Israel. And God still worked in his life. This is what's wrong with the church today. You guys have a distorted view of Jesus, and you're not even worshiping the Jesus of Scripture. You're worshiping the Jesus of your own mind. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, the Bible says, and in due time, he will exalt you. Don't exalt yourself. None of us deserve to be where we are. We deserve death and hell and separated from God, but by his grace, by his mercy and his goodness, He's called us to be his sons and daughters. Enjoy your walk as a Christian because you didn't make it happen. Jesus did. Jesus did. And he chose you and he appointed you that you go and bear fruit and that fruit should remain. Get back to the simplicity of serving Jesus. Amen? Amen. Get back to it, man. Get back to it. Practice love. Practice forgiveness. Practice humility. Don't be a sin sniffer. Don't be a fruit inspector. Be a follower of Jesus. Be a Christian. You're a Christian first. Are the whole world here?